that's fun. Um, <coughs> just to be balanced, why wouldn't you want to be a doctor? High stress, it's one of the high stress uh, specialties of We see very ugly and sad things. We see life and death and dying all the time. Pain and suffering. Uh, so I'll tell you a couple of stories. There was one day I was up working at my desk and I look up and I hear Dr. Lee, the urgency in the voice of the nurse. That's one of my best nurses. And when she says that, I, I pay attention. She's carrying an infant in her arm down the hallway into the room, or the uh, room, so I go over there. Baby's flaccid, just flip. So I, there's no falls, there's no respiration. We start to resuscitate the baby. The baby's four months old. We did all we could do. We CPR medication, put her on oxygen. We worked on her for a long time, actually. So we couldn't get back when she was four months. Parents are outside. And I'm dreading it, of course, but I go outside and tell mom and dad, mom collapses, wailing, collapses on the floor in the ER, on the hallway, just wailing, the whole ER can hear. And I didn't really know what else to say. I had to tell her. She But you know, you have to pull yourself together because you've got other people waiting. They're very busy in the ER. So you see very sad things like that, you know? It really hits you. Um, I thought of another story because um, some of these things are really very realistic. You know, they really, they happen. And uh, there was one day with a 40 ish year old young man or father, him with his, his wife and his kid. He was obviously in a lot of distress, was having a heart attack, and just really circling, you know, just circling the drain, getting worse and worse and worse. And we did everything we could. Shock, shocked him, IV medicine, CPR, all this kind of stuff. All the while, this 11 year old boy was, son was at the bedside with the, with the wife of the patient. So <clears throat> we just tried to resuscitate, tried to resuscitate, and after a while, he just stopped. He can't he just keep going, you know. That one hit me really hard. The son is a was 11 and came to me and thanked me for helping uh, revive his dad. But you know, Josh was 11 at the time. So I had to like, I had to leave the ER. I had to go step outside of the, of the parking lot, just collect myself. Because you know, the rest of the ER doesn't wait for you. There's other people suffering, there's other people dying. They don't wait for you. So it's very hard in that regard. Um, so we talked about critical care, life and death decisions, we see suffering. We see very anxious people, people that are freaked out, you know, they're really screaming and hollering, and they're freaked out and anxious. Um, in terms of professionally, it's one of the specialties that has the highest rate of malpractice. The ER is set up for, you know, bad things to happen anger and anxiety, and so patients accuse doctors and nurses for doing the wrong things a lot. Two-thirds of my shifts have been on the weekends and the nights, so it's, it's hard. You know, you miss a lot of holidays, you miss a lot of family gatherings. And it's one of the specialties that has the highest uh, divorce and suicide rates. So, how do you become an ER doctor? Well, we're first going to do this. this is going to take you really fast. Really fast. <coughs> Come to four years. That's the next step for you guys. <laughs> then, four years of medical school after that. There are combination programs. There's a lot of them. Like, I think it's like 100 of them where you can combine college and medical school into six to seven years versus eight. Then after medical school, you have to train specially for your whatever specialty you want to do. So for emergency medicine, it's usually three years. I did four years, but usually about three years after medical school to become fully certified and practice on your own. So I feel compelled to say a little bit to the ladies because I'm a lady. <laughs> ER is really a great specialty for us, really. It gives a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of hours and shifts. And there's a lot of, um, and yeah, never have to be on call, which is great. Like I said earlier, you get home, you're pretty much done. Okay. We 
we've got a lot of women in the specialty, so there's a lot of camaraderie, a lot of uh, you know, uh, people who really identify with your struggles. And then because we have good income, it helps with the kind of uh, stressor you, stressors you have as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, uh, those tasks that you need, like house clean, cleaning and maybe a babysitter, that kind of thing. And so it, it's, it's good. Um, but again, very, very stressful specialty. Um, you have irregular, irregular hours, so you miss, like I said, a lot of family gatherings and stuff and holidays. You have a higher rate of divorce and suicide amongst uh, the female emergency physicians as compared to the general female pop uh, population. Uh, so we talked about holidays. It can be physically exhausting because you're up. You know, you're up 10 hours, 12 hours to drive to work and come back, and then you've got kids to take care of. And stuff. So it can be very physically exhausting. So we talked <laughs> just the last uh, eight minutes or so about the stressfulness of being an emergency physician. <coughs> why would you want to be a doctor? Oh, and you can probably pick something else that's easier. Well, I've done this 23 years, but I started medical school in 1984. <laughs> so it's been a long time. And uh, I still think being a doctor is really awesome. I think it's a great very honorable, noble profession. Very rewarding, very meaningful profession. You make a difference as a physician, you really do. Uh, you can make a difference in your community by being a family doctor, or you can be an ER doctor in your community and be a crisis interventionalist like I am. You know, you say you're, you're able to know what to do when you're in crisis. Um, in the world, and globally, you can make a difference because you can do missionary work. You can go overseas where there's uh, less staffing and less equipment and less knowledge, and you can help them. You can alleviate pain and suffering as a physician because people suffer, people have pain, and you have the ability to do that. Um, people get sick and they feel hopeless sometimes, but you as a physician, you're trained, you have the knowledge, you have the skill to give them hope. You know, you're, oncologist, a cancer doctor, or if you're a lung doctor, or if you're a cardiologist, you know and your training uh, uh, teaches you enough to give the patient hope that they can live longer or whatever, right? or cure the cancer. <coughs> and then uh, for those who are missionary minded or really um, have a heart for the poor, you, know, you, you help them through the free clinics that are around and you do, like I said, missionary work. And you have financial stability as a physician. You usually won't be unemployed as a physician. There's always a need for doctors. Right. So I finally park, you know. I go in to check in. They ask the most insulting question when you check into a hospital. What seems to be the problem? <laughs> what seems? Well, it seems. <laughs> It seems like everything on my inside wants to be on my outside. <laughs> and I'm no doctor. <laughs> what kind of condescending question? So they check me into my luxurious half room. There's a curtain down the middle with a mystery patient on the other side. And he's moaning over there. <laughs> going to help me with him moaning like that. So I got to out moan him, you know. Quit moaning, we're all hurting. So, that's nice, that's very nice. How about you in medical school? Okay, so you guys can talk to your counselors about what credits you need, what classes you need, blah, blah, blah. I don't know any of that stuff. But just let me give you some practical advice, okay? You need to develop good study habits now, okay? Because when you get into medical school, you're, you think you've got a hard work now, you've got a lot of study to do, a lot, a lot, hours and hours. So you need to learn your, to, to be disciplined with your, with your study habits and efficient, okay, organization, organization, because that helps you get good grades, and good grades means good study habits, right? Avoid or stop bad habits, okay? I can give a whole talk or more just based just on this, alcohol drugs. It really will kill you. I see
see it all the time. Teens, adults, elderly, well, not much elderly, who have drug, drug abuse, but it, it, it really, um, really, for, I'm serious, I don't even know how to begin talking about this. Just get rid of those, or don't even get started on these terrible, terrible habits of being on drugs or alcohol. Um, or staying up all night long and then trying to uh, go to school and try to learn. It's just a terrible, terrible habit, okay? And then make sure you have exercise and diet uh, that's proper and it's good sleep habits because um, if you're fit, you'll have to do this, okay? And you have to endure. This is a long road going to medical school and becoming a doctor, right? You're right? You guys are 17, 16, something like that. Most people enter medical school at 22, 23, 24, but you don't get out to practice till about 30, right? 28, 30, so you've got another 10, 12, 15 years to go before you actually practice as a physician. It's a long, long road. And you'll be sacrificing when buddies are out partying, you're gonna have to be studying. So, endurance, right? Stamina, again, same idea. You have to stay in it, okay? I would recommend you grow your mind and you build your character, meaning that you know, do voluntary work, read, um, exor exercise, go to church or synagogue or whatever. Just be a good person. Learn to be a, just build your character and be a good person. Because when they interview you, they're gonna, they're gonna like you. They're gonna see that you have good character, good strong values, and that you have endurance and persistence and initiative, okay? So, summary. Were you paying attention? Were you guys paying attention? All right. You guys have two minutes. I want to play this for you. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. This is a an actual official trailer. This movie won the LA Film Festival documentary in 2013. It is actually a documentary about an emergency medicine training program in, at USC. Okay. I'll give you an idea of what. If you're an outsider, this looks like total chaos. But I see unity in that chaos. There's a team here coming together to save someone's life. We're starting our senior year as ER doctors. I had heard this was a very difficult place to train. It's one of the most challenging places to work. The gap between thinking and acting is minimal. There is so little tolerance for mistakes. This isn't very good. What happened? During Code Black, it feels like the place is going to blow up at the seams. I knew being a doctor anywhere else was not going to cut it. I knew the mind I've had to mean something. My dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I wanted to have the ability to help somebody who needed it. It scares the hell out of you, and it makes you have to work hard, and there's no excuse. Part of what we're trying to figure out is who we are. The people in the emergency room were just different. I really don't work out that much. <laughs> <laughs> You're seeing people usually in the worst day of their life, helping them cope with that moment. I don't expect that to ever get easy. It really is just about doing the right thing for somebody. When we started this, it seemed so simple. We were going to help people. But as a doctor, the system is sometimes bigger than you. It becomes this bucket of paperwork of saving somebody's life. You work so hard, and all it takes is one thing to kind of topple it all down. You have to ask yourself, how do I protect the ideals I came here for? The crushing regulations on hospitals, they're tying your hands. People that need help are turned away. It's heartbreaking, soul crushing, actually. People leave because they can't wait anymore. The doctors of this hospital believe we can do better. Someone is suffering, what are you gonna do? It's about these moments that are big, that are larger than life. We're in a crisis situation. I think those are pretty high stakes. It's a team fighting to save someone's life. 